This video is the second piece of course content for week two of the course Quantitative Analysis, Applied Inferential Statistics. This video builds on the first, which introduced ggplot2. If you haven't already watched it, go back and do so before continuing. I want to accomplish four things today. First, I want to talk about the idea of statistical transformations and how they apply to data visualization. Second, I want to talk about ways you can work with ggplot2's aesthetics to introduce color and complexity to your plots. Third, I want to discuss how ggplot2 uses coordinate systems. And finally, I want to talk about a general grammatical model for how ggplot2 works. To begin with, I want to talk about the statistical logic of visualization, something ggplot2 refers to as statistical transformations. If we take a look at the bar plot that we created in the first video lecture, it seems really simple, an accounting of the number of observations, in this case cars, that fall into each class of vehicle. But what's going on under the hood? The top box here shows the original data. These are tidy data, a concept we introduced in week one. Each row is a single observation, different configurations of automobiles, and each column is a single variable. There is no summary data in this table. It represents a single unit of analysis. However, the bar plot needs summary data. So behind the scenes, ggplot2 creates virtually the second table using a function called stat count. You won't need to call this function. ggplot2 does that itself. But the second table shows what it accomplishes. For each different value in the variable class, there is a count of the number of observations that have that given value. ggplot2 takes those counts and then portrays them graphically using the geom bar function. Like I said, all of this is happening under the hood. So much as you don't see the mechanical processes at work when you turn the key in a car's ignition, we don't see the statistical transformation anywhere in the ggplot syntax for this particular plot. That is because its presence is implied. If we wanted, we could include it as I've done here. This isn't necessary for bar plots, but the syntax produces the same output. The stat count transformation works behind the scenes with geomes that use discrete data. For continuous variables, there is another transformation called stat bin. This combines similar values in the buckets or bins for plotting. We can either let ggplot2 select the number of bins or define those explicitly. This binning occurs with geomes that use continuous data like this histogram or this line plot. For some geomes, however, it is necessary to specify the stat. One example is the area geom, which requires that we include the stat as part of its syntax. We include it after a comma that separates the stat from the aesthetic mapping. And here is the output we produce. We get something similar to the line plot I just showed, but with the area under the line filled in. In the previous video, we also took a look at box plots, which show where the bulk of observations are, represented by the box, and where outliers are, represented by the dots. These plots also rely on statistical transformations. We can see an example here of a plot that is built using the stat summary geom. This geom gives us access to the minimum and maximum values for a distribution, as well as its midpoint, the median. Here is what that code produces. We won't spend a ton of time using this particular geom this semester, but it underscores the way that ggplot2 manipulates data to produce plots. It also underscores the logic behind box plots something we'll talk more about in week three when we discuss various descriptive statistics. Thus far, we've produced plots that are all on a gray scale. One of the most powerful tools we have at our disposal, beyond the ability to generate the plots themselves, is the ability to use color to highlight important qualities about our data. We can do this using the aesthetic mapping properties built into each geom. To begin with, we can add color arbitrarily to our plots. Sometimes we need to specify fill rather than color, but so long as the syntax remains in the same place, the effect is the same. In this case, we've instructed ggplot2 to arbitrarily add color using the color option next to our aesthetic mapping. Note that the color definition occurs after a comma that separates it from that mapping. This is a really important distinction. And here is the plot now featuring blue colored dots. One warning, though, is that setting colors arbitrarily is deceptively complex. There are lots of things to take into account, and ggplot2 can do the work for you. For now, I'd recommend letting ggplot2 do the heavy lifting. To do that, we'll move 
where that color of fill reference is from outside of the aesthetic mapping to inside the aesthetic mapping. We change where one of the closing parentheses is, and this pushes the labor associated with color selection onto ggplot2. What we put in for the color is irrelevant in some respects. In this case, I use the word class, but really it could be any single string of characters. If we are just adding color, we want to make sure we've wrapped that word in double quotes. This is also a really important distinction. Notice here that one, the plot color has changed again, and two, there is a key now. Your color choice, specifically that word that you pick to implement the color choice, will appear as the key value. So while it is irrelevant in terms of what colors are displayed, ggplot2 is gonna do that for you, it will impact what appears on the key. We often suppress the keys display in this case, however, and we'll cover how to do that at a later point in the semester. Now, something very different happens if we take the double quotes off class, as you see here. We haven't changed anything else about the plot, but it looks totally different. Now we can see that each plot is defined not just by its x and y values relative to fuel efficiency on the y-axis and displacement on the x-axis, but also by what type of car it is. What stands out here is that the different color dots appear to cluster together. The pickups and SUVs generally occupy the low fuel efficiency, high displacement portion of the graph, while compacts and subcompacts occupy the high efficiency, low displacement sector. What is most interesting about this plot is that it highlights a particular type of car, two-seaters, very small cars with large engines. This means that they have high displacement values, given the large engine, but also higher fuel efficiency owing to their small size than we would anticipate based on displacement alone. For bar plots, we can add color to our plots based on individual bars. We can use the fill option instead of color in the geome function since this is a bar plot. Note that this is placed within the aesthetic mapping. Adding that fill option inside the aesthetic mapping gives us this effect. Each bar receives a unique hue. The logic behind this setup means that the bar's color is not explicitly tied to the variable that is being plotted. For instance, if we wanted to shade each bar based on another variable, such as the variation in transmission types within each class of vehicle, that could easily be done. This, for example, would help us see the proportion of each class that is sold with manual transmissions. We change the variable in the fill from class, which is the variable we are plotting with the bars, to the transmission variable. And here we can see that variation within each category. Since there are so many automatic transition categories, the signal we are looking for here does get somewhat lost in the noise of the data. And if this was a production plot, we would probably want to simplify the number of categories that we're working with. However, we can focus in on a large proportion of both compact and subcompact vehicles having pink fills, which indicate manual transitions. One way to clean this plot up would be to disaggregate each bar into separate bars for each transmission type by class. This is known as a position adjustment in ggplot2. Specifically, the effect we are using is called a dodge. We specify this adjustment with the position option after the aesthetic mapping. Note that the order is really important here. The aesthetic mappings parentheses must be closed and there should be a comma before including the position adjustment option. The adjustment gives us a very different looking bar plot. It is much easier to interpret. We can clearly see the increased number of manual transmissions among compacts and subcompacts and the dominance of automatic transitions in other classes of cars. Position adjustments can also be useful for scatter plots. As the book notes, there are 126 points on this plot, despite the fact that there are 234 observations in the data frame. What is happening is that multiple vehicles share the same displacement and fuel efficiency, and therefore their points are stacked on top of each other, almost layered like a cake, obscuring just under half of our data. We can use another type of adjustment called a jitter to make these points stand out. The jitter adjustment adds some random noise around each point meaning that it does not appear in its exact location on the plot, but rather very close by. This greatly expands the number of visible points. This plot here more accurately reflects the distribution in a visual fashion by sacrificing some of the data's precision. A trade-off, for sure, but one that helps our audience in this case. I've made a number of references to points being defined by their position based on two variables, like on this plot here. That definition of space is our next topic. This process of locating points based on their position 
is known as a coordinate system. We can refer to these points as x points, representing values on the horizontal x axis, and y points, representing values on the y axis, which is vertical. Together, they make up an x-y pairing that allows us to place points on the plot relative to both their x and y values. This logic is known as a Cartesian coordinate system, named for the Latinized version of René Descartes' name. While the idea of x-y coordinate pairings was also discovered independently by others, it is Descartes that gets all of the credit. He was a philosopher and mathematician who first published a concept of what would become Cartesian coordinates in 1647. When we use xy coordinates to locate points on a scatter plot, we are implementing the logic of Cartesian coordinate systems. Similarly, when we use bar plots, there are implied x values that represent different bars for two-seaters and other types of cars that can be paired with a y value to create that bar shape. So all of our standard plots in ggplot are going to be defined by their coordinate system, most often this Cartesian coordinate system. We're not bound by it, though. There are other ways to define coordinate systems. This gives us a wide range of possibilities, too wide to delve into here. What we do want to briefly touch on is the ability to flip our coordinates so that x values appear on the y-axis and vice versa. We do this by adding a plus sign and the chord flip function. But why would we do this? We want this functionality to take plots we have where there are discrete x values and display them horizontally, such as the bar plot we made in the previous section. This allows us to change the amount of space our bars can occupy. We can really stretch out the y-axis since our space is much wider than it is tall. This can be useful for bar plots, box plots, and other plots with discrete categories. What we have then is a cohesive language for describing the various elements of a plot. Hadley Wickham, ggplot2's developer, builds on a grammar laid out by Leland Wilkinson in earlier work. We call this the grammar of graphics, which is a reference to Wilkinson's pioneering efforts. We can lay out that grammar here in a basic template. There's the ggplot function, which brings our data in. We layer one or more geomes on top of that to create our visualization and adjust each of those geomes based on aesthetic mappings, statistical transformations, and position adjustments. Beyond individual geomes, we can modify the entire plot's coordinate system and can also add something called faceting. I didn't discuss it here, but the next video includes an example and we'll discuss facets further in the coming weeks. We'll also discuss an extension of this template that does not modify the plot, but does modify the surrounding contextual features like titles, captions, keys, and more.